Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Carly Gabriel. I work in media relations for UNC Health and UNC School of Medicine, and I'll be facilitating this Q&A session this evening. To answer your questions about COVID-19 vaccines, we have with us a panel of physicians and researchers with UNC Health and the UNC School of Medicine who can address a range of topics. We have Dr. David Wall, who is a professor in the Department of Medicine an infectious diseases specialist and medical director of the COVID vaccination clinic at UNC Hospitals Hillsborough campus. Dr. Crystal Sine is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and the UNC Health System Executive Director of Health Equity. Dr. Matthew Vogt is an assistant professor in both departments of pediatrics and microbiology and immunology and focuses on pediatric infectious diseases. Dr. Genevieve Neil Perry is the chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and researches women's fertility and reproductive health. Dr. Lisa Rahongale is a professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and researches reproductive infectious diseases. And finally, Dr. Samantha Meltzer Brody is the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and founder of the Taking Care of Our Own program and the UNC Wellbeing program. And first, we're going to start with a message from Dr. Meltzer Brody. Good evening, everyone. I wanted to say a few words about the fact we're living during an extremely difficult time. And there are many strong feelings and emotions about the pandemic and vaccines. And all of us are concerned about our individual safety and that of our families. And all of us are trying to navigate this difficult time as best we can. Please know that we certainly recognize the validity of a variety of concerns and questions, um, your worries and fears about the vaccine and about being vaccinated both for yourself and your families and children. We wanna hear the concerns and the questions. This is really important because it enables us to have good conversations and provide factual information. We know that some information out there is very scientifically based, and you're going to hear that from the experts tonight on the panel. We know that there's a lot of information out there that is misinformation, and it's not factual. And sometimes it's hard to know what is what, and things travel around. And we're hoping tonight to provide some answers to your questions that are thoughtful and are factual and are scientifically based. We also understand that the answers you hear were, will not always provide 100% reassurance. And that's why it's so important that we continue the conversation, that you continue to talk to your peers and your leaders about your questions, and that you talk to trusted colleagues at work and reach out to any of us so we can provide the most up-to-date and factual information. Please review the multiple resources we are sharing about the vaccines and the safety information so that we can continue this conversation and do our best to help and support each other. We know that this current environment is so stressful for all of us, and this is a critical moment for us to make sure we are taking care of ourselves, our peers, our coworkers, and our families. We have many resources available to provide support, including our helpline, which is 984-215-5655. And if you are concerned about your own well-being, that of a colleague at work, that of a family member, um, please reach out and get help. Um, all of this information is on our website with the well-being program. And we want to hear from you so we can help provide support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Meltzer Brody. So we'll get started with answering your questions now. And just a reminder that tonight is dedicated to questions about clinical safety and efficacy of vaccines, including for children, as Dr. Vogt is happy to answer questions on that topic. You can enter your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. And as you all begin doing that, we'll start with a few questions that were sent ahead of time via email. Dr. Wall, I'll direct this first question to you. Development of the vaccine felt rushed. Why are we mandating it when it's not fully approved by the FDA and we don't know about the long-term side effects? Why should we trust that it's safe? Yeah, thank you, Carly. This is a really important question. I think gets to the crux of a lot of people's concerns about the vaccination and the way that the vaccine has been rolled out 
over the last several months. So I'll, I'll break that down because I think there's there's at least three parts of that. One is the idea of this being rushed. And I would say that there's there's maybe a difference between rushing and expediting. And I don't think that this is mincing words. I think they're different. And I think what we saw here was a real urgency. Um, and when I'm talking about expediting, I'm talking about expediency, like what we do when there's an emergency. We, we rush, right? But we're doing it in a very deliberate way. We're not doing it in a haphazard way. Um, when we respond to a, a, an emergency in the hospital or we respond to a, a natural disaster, like a fire, um, our firefighters do it in a, in a, a deliberate, expedient way, in, in a way that makes sense, in a way that's rigorous. I really do think that those analogies are not um, imperfect at all when we talk about the vaccine. We asked our scientists, we asked the companies that had already had a head start to help us get a vaccine. And they produced, and I don't think they should be blamed for doing that as quickly as physically possible. Look, I'm not part of any sort of vaccine mafia. I, trust me, I am not. And we were involved in the clinical trials here. And I could tell you the way we've always done clinical trials, we didn't shortchange anything. Consent was done, the blood processing, the examinations, the schedule of events, everything was done. I's were dotted, T's were crossed. There was nothing that was shortchanged. And I really saw, think what you've seen here is almost like a moonshot exercise. So I don't think it was rushed. I think it was done deliberately quickly so we could get an answer quickly. That's number one. Number two is mandate. The good thing is there's so far at this point, um, very few places where this is mandatory. And I think that's what we talk about mandate. There are exceptions to getting the vaccine, including now our healthcare system. But what we're talking about is a balance because we've had a long time where the vaccine's been out there and we have some situations like nursing homes, like some schools, like our healthcare facilities, where there is a risk, especially with the Delta variant, of people acquiring the virus, and even before they become symptomatic, shedding it to other people and infecting others. So there becomes a balance where the public good and the safety of our organization and our patients tips towards really having everyone vaccinated. This is not new. We know this because we all have to be vaccinated against influenza, and we have to be vaccinated against hepatitis B and mumps, measles, and rubella. But some of you will say, okay, but th those are FDA approved. The good news about the vaccines right now is that we've got a lot of data from a lot of people. And I do expect any day now, maybe, that we will see FDA approval for the mRNA vaccines. And I think that will be important for many people. And if you're waiting for that, that's gonna happen soon. We have months of data. Remember that the EUA, the authorization, required there be at least three months of follow-up data after the vaccine studies and approval requires six months, and we're beyond six months now. So they have those data. Lastly, I'll say, you know, in all the vaccine studies we've seen so far for all vaccines, the big problem is usually right after you get vaccinated, not months or years later. So I'm not too worried that we're gonna see, you know, some other shoe drop years from now. That's not generally how vaccines work. In fact, you can't have your cake and eat, you can't be like, oh, I'm worried that the effect of the vaccine is gonna wear off and I'm gonna be susceptible to COVID, but at the same time, be worried that the negative effects are gonna be lasting. So really, I think what folks have to understand is, you know, as more people now get vaccinated, 197 people have had at least one dose. 167 people, 50% of the whole population of the United States of America have received full vaccination. And we've had longer periods of time to observe this. So what better proving ground do we have than half the country getting vaccinated and now having months and months and months of follow-up in which we've seen that they're highly effective and that they're safe. Thank you, Dr. Wall. So next we'll go to Dr. Sine. We'll start with you for this question. I have had COVID. Why do I need to get vaccinated? Yeah, so again, another great question and one that we also have some data for to guide us in the answer. So when we've studied this and we know that um, even among people who've been infected with COVID, when you look at those people who've been previously infected naturally, they got COVID 
wherever. Um, those who were not vaccinated, who didn't go on to get vaccinated were twice as likely, two times more likely to get reinfected um, than those who were fully vaccinated after they'd had COVID. And so that really tells us that the vaccines are better protection um, against subsequent reinfection than just what's called natural immunity, meaning what you get after you've been exposed to the virus. So definitely we know that even if you've had COVID, you should still get vaccinated because you're gonna get better protection um, than what you would get with just natural immunity alone and that you're gonna be protected from reinfection better than if you do not get vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Sine. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Great, we'll move on to our next question. This is for Drs. Neil Perry and Rahang Delay. Is the vaccine safe for me if I'm pregnant, trying to get pregnant, or I'm in my childbearing years and plan to have children? Will it cause infertility or impact my unborn child? And in the chat, someone specifically asked about Johnson and Johnson, but I think we would like to hear about all of the vaccines. Dr. Neil Perry, would you like to start with the getting okay. pregnant and I'll do the pregnant part? So we're, we're gonna be a bit of a little of a tag team here. And um, in terms of whether the vaccine itself affects fertility, there's no data to support that. Um, in fact, um, there have been uh, several studies over the last um, year looking at the antibodies that the, similar to what the um, virus would make and looking at whether it impacts fertility or pregnancy itself. And the data suggests that that's not the case. But what I will tell you is that, um, and I think this is where it gets a little confusing for people, is that there have been some studies that have reported that um, women who have been infected with the virus have had some problems with their menstrual periods. And, and the reason that may be the case in terms of the virus itself, not the vaccine, is that when people are really sick, illness itself can disrupt your period and have an impact on your fertility. And so I think that that information is getting confused in that there have been some individuals who've been sick that then went on to have problems in terms of their menstrual cycle, but this has not been demonstrated at all with the vaccine. I'm gonna hand the next part off in terms of pregnancy to Dr. Rogendahl. Sure, so, um, so first I wanted to just say that before the COVID pandemic, we recommended women who were attempting pregnancy, who were pregnant, who were breastfeeding to get vaccines. That was a normal part of care. And um, we also learned from before the pandemic that pregnant women who um, get respiratory infections are at higher risk of ending up in the hospital or in the ICU with a breathing tube um, and even dying. So these were all known things before the COVID pandemic and, um, and things that we were on the lookout in terms of women who were trying to get pregnant or pregnant or breastfeeding. Of course, with the pandemic, we have been very concerned about pregnant women um, becoming infected. And we have learned and seen before the vaccine that indeed pregnant women who were infected with COVID were more likely to end up in the hospital um, or in the ICUs and have adverse outcomes not only for themselves, but also for their babies. So we always say that, you know, healthy mom, we need a healthy mom in order to have a healthy baby. And so we have found that women who have um, been in, um, sick with COVID ha are in at increased risk of premature labor and premature birth, which of course impacts um, the long-term outcomes of any baby born prematurely. So, um, you know, that, made any of us who take care of pregnant women very concerned about this pandemic, um, just like we were concerned about all patients, but compared to a, a woman who is not pregnant, a pregnant woman is at higher risk, and therefore that puts her baby at risk. So when vaccines came out, we were thrilled that that was an option because we've always used vaccines as tools to help keep both our um, moms safe and the uh, pregnancies that they're carrying safe. 
we give vaccines already in pregnancy in order to pass antibodies to the babies um, so that they are more protected when they're born. And you know what? We found out that women who are vaccinated with the COVID vaccine do pass those antibodies off when they're pregnant and when they're breastfeeding. So that's really great. Um, the studies that were done on the COVID vaccine were studied um, rigorously. They were studied in animals during pregnancy. They were studied. Um, they've been somebody mentioned the Johnson and Johnson vaccine that actually the um, viral platform that's used to um, develop the Johnson and Johnson was the same one that's been used in another um, vaccine uh, for the Ebola vaccine. And that has been used in pregnant women for years. Um, and so that's, you know, really great safety data. We've had over 147,000 pregnant women be vaccinated and registered and have not found any evidence of increased risk of miscarriage or adverse pregnancy outcome. And, um, and therefore, I'm so happy that I have this tool to help protect the patients that I'm taking care of and um, ultimately the, you know, their children that, um, you know, we want to, of course, take care of mom and baby as obstetricians, so. Thank you both so much for those answers. So next we're gonna go to Dr. Vogt. Is the vaccine safe for children? Yes. No, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, so, but first I'm gonna reflect on that previous question as the provider who then cares for children who are born to mothers uh, who have been vaccinated or not, I am always very appreciative when the mothers have been vaccinated for all the reasons that were just stated. When mom gets vaccinated, all those antibodies get passed right along to baby, and that gives our babies the best running start at life too. So pediatrician gives the thumbs up as well um, to back up the ob guys and, and thank them for, for what they're advocating. The um, question though was, is the vaccine safe for children? So actually, I was asked to participate in this panel two days ago, and then just yesterday, a very nice, thorough New England Journal of Medicine article was published uh, with data on adolescents. So patients from ages 12 to 17, specifically very much focused on uh, safety, on adverse effects, comparing placebos versus the, uh, in this case, it was the Moderna mRNA vaccine. Um, and uh, a resounding yes is the answer to the question, is the vaccine safe for children? Um, so looking at your sort of, you know, normal side effects, I think a lot of us have heard about, you know, you can have a little achiness at the site of the injection, you can have some headache. Certainly those are common side effects in adolescents, just as they are in adults. Um, but in this particular study, there were absolutely zero serious adverse effect, uh, serious adverse events reported out of a little over 3,000, uh, or sort of, sorry, um, 2,500 or so patients. And then uh, the additional thing that I think people might be thinking of when they think about vaccine safety in uh, younger aged vaccinees, which includes the adolescents, ages 12 and up, as well as uh, sort of young adults, so in that maybe 18 through the 20s, early 30s range, there have been reports of serious side effects like uh, heart inflammation. And what I'll say about that is, one, it's a very, very, it's on the, the order of those very, very rare side effects that we see. Two, it's actually, as far as heart inflammation, which sounds scary goes, it's very, very mild. Um, nobody has suffered, these people actually get better very quickly. And three, COVID itself causes a very severe form of heart inflammation that we do see both in children and, and young adults. And this is that MISC syndrome. So part of that MISC, uh, definitely one of the components of that can be a very severe form of the heart inflammation. And no one who's been vaccinated has ever had anything even approaching the severity of what we see in those MISC cases. Um, those are the people who are on like the, the heart lung bypass machines that we call ECMO. Um, that doesn't happen after the vaccines. So by and large, very safe for, for the adolescent age groups that we've studied. There are ongoing studies in age groups that are below the age of 12. Those data just haven't been published yet. Um, and I don't have any particular insider info on 
what the early returns are. Perhaps one of the other physicians like Dr. Wool who, who performs these studies, I don't know if he has any insider info that he can share with us, but nothing's been published in the age groups that are, that are below the age of 12 so far. Thank you, Dr. Vogt. And just a reminder that you can enter your questions into the Q&A chat box, and we will try to address as many as possible this evening. Uh, and if you have joined us a little late, uh, we have a panel of UNC Health and UNC School of Medicine physicians and researchers answering clinical questions about the safety and effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines. And this is being recorded and we will share it later. And we can also follow up with some of the research and studies that have been quoted. So next, we're gonna go back to Dr. Wall. So Dr. Wall, this is specifically about the mRNA technology for the vaccine. Uh, and one person has the question, why go with a never approved method versus a traditional vaccine like the influenza vaccine? Why reinvent the wheel now? Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. And part of the problem I think we have to recognize is that um, vaccinology hasn't really been extremely innovative for a long time because um, there's been very few crises that have required people to develop new vaccines quickly uh, to meet a major crisis. And Dr. Hangali appropriately pointed out, you know, the Ebola vaccine, which was stood up um, in a manner of speaking fairly quickly to meet a crisis, turned out to be really highly effective and used an older technology, the adenovirus technology. And that is what we see now with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So we have one that does use an older technology that has been shown to be effective in the past. So we took something off the shelf. That's what the Russians did. That's what the Chinese did. Um, and that was because they really didn't have any other technology. The mRNA technology that's being used now for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines was working its way through to become a very new prominent technology and was going to meet some very important needs and addressed really the problem with like what we see with influenza. Why does the influenza shot kind of work some years and kind of not work some years? Because it takes so long to figure it out, to develop it, to get it to grow, and then to get into people's arms. And by that time, the virus has shifted or changed. So in short, mRNA technology was a very promising technology. It was working its way through the pipeline to get us some really great vaccines. And the people who were developing it said, oh my God, here's a sequence. We know about this virus. We could just repurpose this. This could work. And we've seen this done for other types of things, like for even medicines. We do that all the time. Um, and so there's medicines like remdesivir that's being used to treat COVID-19. It's the only FDA approved treatment for COVID-19. It wasn't developed for COVID-19. It was developed for something else. So we see innovative technologies applied for cancer therapy, um, for treating multiple sclerosis, for treating all sorts of diseases. And sometimes those turn out to be winners. So I'm glad we have mRNA vaccines because they turn out to be some of the most effective vaccines on the planet. And I really think that it was a technology that was going to blossom to something important anyhow. And COVID came along and gave it its opportunity. I can even add a little personal anecdote to go with that. The laboratory that I worked uh, and the people I collaborated with before I came to UNC was actually already partnering with Moderna well before the COVID pandemic ever happened. Again, reflecting on this idea of this is a technology that's been in development for many, many, many years. This just happens to be the first time it's been rolled out in a major way, but, but this has been worked on tested in humans before just the COVID-19 pandemic. So we, we were developing, for example, an antibody technology for Zika, which is the virus that can sometimes cause babies to have small heads. Um, so sort of a different emerging virus that happened in the past, we were already working on that with the Moderna company specifically using mRNA technology. So it's definitely been around for a while. And I can raise my hand and say I was at least privy to some of that work that happened before the pandemic. So we have quite a few questions about uh, side effects of the vaccines and very serious side effects that have been reported. Um, there are questions uh, about how that data is being collected and how we actually 
um, know what serious side effects are happening and specifically um, someone in, is asking about uh, neurological issues and uh, would it be safe for someone, for example, who has epilepsy to take these vaccines if that's a potential side effect? Dr. Wall, we can start with you, um, but anyone who has an answer is welcome. Yeah, the quite a good question. Um, and again, these are pretty well studied vaccines now. They're under the most scrutiny of any vaccines that we've ever seen released. And so we know a lot about their side effects. When even just a few people start to get some sort of signal for a side effect, you hear about it in the news. That's how sensitive we are appropriately to this. Um, so the good news is we've not seen any neurological sequelae at all. In fact, and this is something I think we're going to come back to is the side effects of COVID-19 are pretty awful. Um, and we're learning that even people, especially children who get COVID-19 that's fairly mild or moderate can suffer from even long COVID. And we don't understand what proportion, but it doesn't seem to be small. And we do see neurological complications of long COVID. And we're not seeing that in people who get vaccinated. So, again, I think there's this whole thing what we're talking about and we're going to come back to today is this balance between the known benefits versus these unknown theoretical potential risks. You know, this black box of stuff we don't know about that could happen next month or next year or 10 years from now. And you can fill your mind because uncertainty is an uncomfortable feeling with all sorts of possibilities. But the known benefits are just so tremendous right now that really it would have to be something pretty darn awful to offset that, to be frank and to be honest. And so we are not seeing that. And again, history tells us there are good examples of vaccines that didn't work out. We knew it right away. You know, there have been vaccines for dengue, for measles, for RSV that were flops. It didn't take long to figure that out. And it didn't take 200 million people to get vaccinated to figure that out. Would anyone else like to comment? Okay, another question that came up in the chat. Uh, do we know how many admitted COVID patients in our hospitals uh, have had a vaccine versus uh, are unvaccinated? Dr. Wall. I want to make sure if there's other people. Um, so the good news is we are starting to track this, especially in our ICU. And I checked in yesterday with the ICU attending. And so we're going to try to have a more formal way of doing this. But right now, almost nobody who is in the ICU. And, and now remember, our ICU is overflowing. We're going to start a second branch of the ICU at the medical center because we have not enough beds in the regular ICU. So almost nobody is vaccinated. Now, remember, not everyone who's vaccinated does the vaccine take. Remember, in the Moderna and Pfizer studies, we knew that 95% of people who got COVID in those studies were the people who got placebo. But that means five out of 100 um, were people who got vaccinated. So some people, it could break through. We are now vaccinating people who are in their 80s, people who have immunocompromising conditions. And so that's who I have to be honest with you in this early phase of the Delta surge we've seen come into the hospital mostly, especially the ICU. Now, again, we do know that there are some people, a small proportion, who the vaccine just may not do what we need it to do. Maybe their own immune systems, even though they're not immunocompromised, just as vulnerable to this. That doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. We know that the vast majority of people in Southwest Missouri, in Texas, here in North Carolina, if you are hospitalized and seriously ill with COVID-19, the chances are overwhelming that you are unvaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Wall. So now I have a question for Dr. Sine. What would you say to people who have a mistrust of healthcare establishments or clinical trials and are still very hesitant right now to get a vaccine? First thing I would say is there is very good reason to be distrustful of health systems or government systems um, also. So I would acknowledge and say, I think there's good reason. And at the same time, I think that we have enough um, 
we have enough data if that would convince you um, that the vaccines are safe and that they are effective. But if you don't, if you're not convinced by data, I would certainly say now is the time to really try to move past that mistrust, whether it's warranted or not. And I think in many cases it is um, to really try to connect with people who've been personally affected by this. If you haven't, um, just talk to some folks who are, and you will see how devastating this has been for them and their families. And I think that that should really catalyze people to move beyond the trust issues. Again, I, I want to say very clearly that there are many reasons that certain groups should be distrustful. However, at the same time, we need to move past that because people are dying. Over 600,000 people have died already. We're going to obviously see more deaths. Primarily, those are going to be in people of color. Um, and so we have to move past that. This is the time to do it. If ever there was a time, we have got to move past that. Thank you, Dr. Sine. So another question from one of our teammates, I would like to just open up to everyone uh, if they want to share. Uh, let me find it. So it basically said that uh, seeing some nurses and physicians who uh, do not want to get the vaccine is concerning for them. Um, they're wondering if you all would provide guidance on why some people on the front line are refusing to get a vaccine. I mean, I guess I can start off. I would just say, I think some of the reasons are the same reasons that other people are, are hesitant about getting the vaccine. I don't know that the reasons are any different. However, I do think the implications of frontline clinicians, um, nurses, physicians not getting it, the implications are much greater. Um, when we are taking care of folks who are sick. They come into our hospitals and our clinics because either they're sick or they're at high risk for being sick. Um, I think we have to, the responsibility that we have as healthcare professionals really sh should in some way supersede our own personal misgivings because we're putting other people um, at risk when we don't want to take the vaccine and we're taking care of people who are sick. We have to also think about that person, the patient in front of you and their families. And it's not at all to dismiss our own concerns, but I think that we have responsibilities um, as healthcare professionals. And I think that we have responsibilities as leaders and people look to us as clinicians, as physicians, nurse practitioners, you know, PAs, nurses, um, they look to us to lead, and I think that this is one of the ways that we have to show leadership, but certainly if we're taking care of people who are sick, we need to think very long and hard about the implications of not being vaccinated and how that's putting those that we have, you know, in a lot of cases taken an oath to take care of, how that's affecting them. I'd like to just um, add to Dr. Sine's comments. Um, and what I'd like to add is that there is a lot of misinformation on the internet, and it is near impossible to be able to figure out what's fact and what's not. And, and quite frankly, it's scary. And you know, and if there, you know, if you have any underlying um, concerns around trust, it, it's going to make you that much more hesitant. You know, the um, the the internet is a great place, right? Because we can communicate and we can actually educate each other. But what's happening now is there is a tremendous amount of miseducation, um, misinformation, and it's making it hard for people to make informed decisions around their care. Um, the other thing I'd like to um, add to Dr. Sine's comment is that, you know, the, the thing about COVID also is that you're not necessarily sick, but you're infectious. And so, you know, you're not coughing, walking around, feeling bad, you, you feel great. But at the same time, you could be infecting other people who have entrusted you with their care. And so it, while it is, a, you know, while it's, it's scary, it's, it's tough, it's hard, um, I would agree with Dr. Sine that we, we as healthcare providers have additional responsibilities. 
both to keep our patients safe as well as to leave. I'll add, you know, of course, I um, I'm taking care of pregnant women, you know, um, we pregnant women in general um, have um, messaging that if it, something isn't necessary, we, you know, we don't necessarily um, take it right um, only what's necessary in pregnancy in terms of uh, medications or exposures and things like that. And so I think that's the, you know, the thought process for a lot of women who want to do everything they can to be, you know, um, to make sure their baby is healthy. And so um, that is the rationale that I hear um, a lot. And, um, and I feel like with the way the pandemic is going that um, and the risk that pregnant women have, um, and particularly with how um, devastating this Delta variant is, that's, you know, a whole, you know, these are all women now who are at high risk um, for having a negative outcome along with their baby. And so, you know, um, I think that there, you know, there was a thought that this is a temporary situation. I'm only pregnant for so long. And then, um, you know, maybe I can get the vaccine after that. But now the time is now where women are at risk. And so um, it, it has become necessary in order to have, you know, to be stay healthy and to have a healthy baby. And I also add that, you know, many women are, you know, there you have your baby and then um, you have other children at home who are younger and haven't been able to be vaccinated as well. And so there's multiple and um, or your baby has to, you know, get child care either inside the home or outside the home. So there's so many exposures that um, can be limited if um, women go ahead and get vaccinated to protect their whole family. Um, you know, either while they're trying to get pregnant, they are pregnant or while they're breastfeeding. So I just think that the situation has shifted with the Delta variant and um, we really need to um, think about, yeah, you know, that yes, pregnancy is a time limited course, but the, you know, we're at a very risky time right now. I also was reflecting on the question about, you know, seeing doctors and nurses who are hesitant to get the vaccine themselves. And I think I'd like to put some attempt at, at a, a rough quantification on that because I think it's th they exist, right? So there's what tens or hundreds of thousands of people in this country who are doctors and nurses. And so you're there's no chance we'll ever get all of those people on the same page. And we're an opinionated bunch, right? We were we were brought up to be educated and speak our minds, and we do. So when I go to a conference of pediatric infectious diseases doctors and we talk about the best way to treat bone infections you will come up with so many different ways and so many opinions and a lot of those ways will work and, and it's not always hard. But when you bring up, should we get our COVID vaccines? Yeah, I mean, it is the rare, you know, four leaf clover or, or unicorn or whatever. It is the rare doctor at any one of those conferences that I would ever hear saying, I'm not so sure about those vaccines. So. I, I think you can find them, sure, if you're looking for them. I mean, we have ways of amplifying messages these days that we never had before. But to, to put a quantification on it, we're not shy people. We're more than happy to stand up and say, I'm not so sure about something. I don't really see very many physicians, at least in, the, in these groups of not shy people who are talking about it. We rushed to get our vaccines, couldn't wait to be in line rolled up our sleeves as soon as we possible. There was a meme out there uh, for those who are, you know, enjoy a meme now and then, uh, where all the doctors said, you know what, if they told me I had to stick it in my eye, I'd stick it in my eye. I probably would have let them stick it in my eye. I mean, I would have thought a little harder about that one, but, you know, we, the people that I know and talk to at least, it's really, really wanted their vaccines. And so I think that the, that those people certainly exist, right? There, there's no way we were gonna get 100,000 people to agree on something ever. But it's a very, very tiny fraction. And so I think most of the people I talk, everybody I talk to is, is all for it. I wanted to add, um, taking off of what all of you guys have said about um, misinformation. So, um, you know, one of the things that I recently um, heard somebody speak, so I'm 
you know, these are ideas that came from another person, but they were talking about how when we learn to use the library, those of us that are of the age that learn to use the card catalog, we were taught how to gather information. We were taught how to use the card catalog, how to look something up in a book, how to use the encyclopedia, things like that. Now we just have all of this amazing information out there and nobody has been trained as to how to use it. And um, some tips that I thought were really useful if you are seeing, you know, blogs or posts from individuals that report that they are healthcare providers and do not want to get the vaccine is look at um, not just their credentials because um, that is one thing, but, you know, are there advertisements associated with that? You know, what's why, why are they putting that opinion out there? Um, is there something else going on that is promoting that opinion? Um, when you're reading an article, um, you know, many times the comments that an article that might be positive that you might finish reading, you read the comments and then there's all this commentary that's put in there that um, can sway your opinion. Um, make your opinion first before you think about what all the other people who do not have qualifications are just people who are making comments do and then go to a resource that isn't promoting um, isn't promoted by a financial gain or something like that, like through our societies, like the American College of OBGYNs um, and, you know, other. Um, the CDC and other organizations that actually do not have any type of profit with the messaging that they're putting out there. So I thought that was um, useful information uh, that I'm going to try to now share with patients that I have. And so and it, I'm connecting it back to just, you know, where are you hearing about some of these doctors um, or nurses or whatever health practitioners, if you're hearing about it on the internet, just think about the source and where it's coming from. Thank you all for those answers. So we'll go back to Dr. Wall for this one. Dr. Wall, uh, how would you address the number of events captured in the voluntary vaccine adverse event reporting system? And do you think that that provides an accurate picture of all adverse events and possible deaths from the vaccines? So the VAERS reporting system, which the um, person is referring to, has been a subject of a lot of discussion, especially QAnon and other forums have really focused on this. And I think we should understand what it is. So this is a voluntary reporting system that anybody, you don't have to be a healthcare provider, any one of us and people who we live with, can type in and report an adverse event um, in someone who has been vaccinated. So it's imperfect, of course. Um, it's designed to be extremely sensitive, but not specific, meaning it's supposed to be casting a wide net so that if there are a bunch of things that happen that look out of the ordinary, like ringing ears or blood clots or things like that, investigators from the FDA and the CDC can pick up on this. This is supposed to be a canary in the coal mine kind of thing. It's not supposed to be an accurate tabulation of causative events that are linked to the vaccine. So again, I'm a, I, I'm a big fan of analogies. There are plenty of people who bought an iPhone over the last six months. And you know what? Some of them died within two weeks of buying the iPhone. That does not mean the iPhone killed them. So we do know that there are people who died and I've reported into theirs adverse events that I did not think had anything to do with the vaccine, but just out of full trying to you know, do as much as we can to provide a good database, we put that in. But yesterday I put in a reaction of someone who had a swollen arm and didn't feel well after the vaccine. So there's a mix in there. So I would not overinterpret the bears. It's not designed to be, um, like I said, a tabulation, like we would do in a clinical trial. Like what we do and what we've talked about today, uh, of, you know, when we do a rigorous clinical trial, like we did with Moderna, with Pfizer, with J and J, with Novavax, et cetera, we look for those events and we have a denominator and a numerator. How many people got it out of all the people who got this? And how do we compare that to placebo? This is nothing like that. So let's be really clear. There's a very, very, very small number of people who may have even died from getting a COVID-19 vaccine. Those really relate to those blood clots that we saw in those women. Um, and some of those were not managed. Some of those women got inappropriate management. But other than those clots that were associated with the J&J &J vaccine, which has been very well studied and we've talked a lot about, 
We have not seen deaths linked to the mRNA vaccines at all or other deaths related to J and J. Thank you. Now I'd like to talk about the Delta variant. We've had quite a few questions about that. Uh, so how well do the vaccines work against the Delta variant? And if there is, uh, if they are less effective against the Delta variant, should people still get the vaccines that are currently available? Dr. Wall, I, I think you can start us off again. Yeah, and I know Dr. Sune has a lot of thoughts about this too. So um, short answer is the vaccines do work. Let's talk about what work means against the Delta variant. The number one thing I want from my vaccine is to keep me out of our MICU. That's, and, 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 and from dying, okay? So I don't wanna die from COVID-19 and I don't wanna end up on ECMO or hooked up to a ventilator. I don't even wanna be in the hospital. And so the vaccines work very well at keeping people out of the hospital, out of the ICU and getting died, okay? That's what we want from a vaccine. So that we know, and they do, all three vaccines seem to do this very well against Delta. And the Israeli data show the same thing. When they really look at hospitalization in Israel, they find that the mRNA vaccine, they use the Pfizer vaccine, was highly effective, hardly at all different than the Alpha variant, the UK variant they had previously. The difference with Delta variant and the vaccines is that the Delta variant has evolved to get around our native immune system somewhat. So what happens is the antibodies we make that we first throw at coronavirus when it gets into our system, let's put pressure on the virus. Because if a little virus pops up that can evade that immune system for a little bit longer, it's going to get spread more efficiently. So because we keep ping-ponging this you know, between each other all over the planet, we've given an opportunity for a variant to emerge that can evade our natural immune system for a little bit longer, replicate longer, so you get higher levels of virus for a longer period of time that you can spread to other people. That's a perfect recipe for an enhanced spreading virus. And that's what we see with Delta. It's hyper infectious because it's evaded our immune system. So it does have an impact even on our vaccine induced immunity. And that's why we see people who are vaccinated get high levels of the virus in their nose and throat. Okay, for maybe a shorter period of time than, than unvaccinated people, but certainly high levels of virus. And this is going to get into our maybe our discussion of masking and why we're concerned that even vaccinated people now can spread the virus to other people. But the difference between a vaccinated person and an unvaccinated person is it ends there. If you're unvaccinated, the next step is in your lungs. And we have virus in your lungs. You know what we call that? Pneumonia. But when you're vaccinated, it stays up here and then your immune system kicks in and gets rid of it. That's the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated. That's the difference between staying out of the hospital and getting in the hospital. So why get vaccinated? Because you want coronavirus, COVID-19, to be a nuisance, not a death sentence. You want it to be something, you get coronavirus and you're like, bummer, I got coronavirus, I'm going to be out of work for a day or two, I don't want to infect anyone else, I'm going to wear a mask but I'm gonna be fine. If you're vaccinated, that is almost certainly what's gonna happen. If you're unvaccinated and you have risk factors for severe disease, it could be very, very different. So I don't want people to think just because you get this virus in your nose, and we could talk all about vaccines and what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to allow the germ to come into your system and then let the immune system attack it. People I think have to understand that it's not a breakthrough to get it in your nose and throat. That's what's supposed to happen and then your immune system pounces on it and gets rid of it. So definitely get vaccinated if you don't want to get hospitalized or get really sick with coronavirus. Dr. Sine, did you want to add anything? Um, I don't think I, David always does such a great job. I don't think I had anything else to add. I think he made all of the points, but I, I think it, it is important too to say if he didn't already say it, that um, when you are fully vaccinated, you're just going to be infectious for um, a shorter amount of time. That's the other piece, right? That you're not going to continue to have it and be infectious for a long amount of time. And time is really important. And we know from the early stuff that it's a function of sort of how much virus is in your right over time and time, right? And so if you can be infectious for less time, that is really important too. So that's the other benefit. 
um, for being uh, vaccinated. And, and we know that the vaccines work against the Delta variant, but no vaccine is 100%. And I think the things that I often hear, are, what about, uh, you know, the breakthrough infections? And I think Dr. Wall alluded to this. I mean, there are going to be breakthrough infections, right? The vaccines are not 100%. Um, but again, for all of the reasons that we already talked about, it's still better than not getting vaccinated. And why my masking yeah, is so I can add, So it's sort of like, again, I love these analogies because I think they help people, but it helps me understand, like someone who says, you know, I was in a car accident and I had my seatbelt on and I broke my arm. See? <laughs> but, I, but you didn't go through the windshield. Right. You know, that's, that's what these vaccines are like. It's like the seatbelt. Um, and so some things can happen if you're in a bad enough action. If you get enough virus in your system uh, or your own immune system is not as good as it could be to fight this particular virus, yeah, you might get sick. Um, and we've had some young people who have gotten hospitalized, but that's so unlikely. Um, and really what we're seeing is it's, if you're not vaccinated, then there's no defense against this. This might be one of our last questions, um, Dr. Sine and Dr. Wall, you may be able to address this. Uh, if you have had COVID, is there any risk in then getting a vaccine? I, I think that um, goes back to the question that we had earlier. No, um, there's not a risk in get, you, you should still get vaccinated, even if you'd had COVID. Is that the question, Caroline, or is there a nuance there that I'm missing? That, that is the main question. Um, and also, do you need to wait for a specific period of time? Um, does it make a difference whether you've had the Delta variant? Um, and I, I'm actually not sure if people are aware of what variant they have at this point or are getting at this point. Um, but does that make a difference? David can correct me if I'm wrong. I think the predominant type now is Delta variant. That's what we're seeing. Um, so I, for, for that part of the question, um, and I think the other part of the question was around how long you needed to wait. Is that a, after you've been, after you've had a natural, just been infected with COVID, how long do you need to wait after vaccines? Um, so I think it's three weeks, but you guys correct me if I'm wrong. There's no, there's Has no that change. It, yeah. I, yeah. I think it's kind of people do different amounts. So here. Yeah. So I think this is, this is an interesting point and I'm glad someone brought it up. So the reason that, and like Dr. Sine said before, is the reason we vaccinate folks who've had COVID-19 is we've seen reinfection. Um, so we know that the immunity that you make to natural infection is pretty specific to what variant you got. There's a really nice, CDC report just from last week that in Kentucky, they looked at people who were infected yeah. last year and got COVID again this year. Um, and this is even pre-Delta, <laughs> so this is pretty interesting. So what they saw was that if you were vaccinated, um, your chances of getting reinfected, of getting COVID again, was much less than people who were unvaccinated. In fact, the unvaccinated had two and a half times yeah. the risk. So it was just much rarer. So what we're, that proves is that People who are vaccinated probably make a more robust, broader response that even covers some of the newer variants. And I think that's what we're seeing in the lab as well. That even though it wasn't designed against Delta, the, uh, Pfizer, the Moderna, and J and J vaccines have cross reactivity against it, which is a good thing because you know all the spike proteins from these viruses have some similarities, and the antibodies that we develop after vaccination just have to attach onto the spike protein, and they seem to do that. So, yeah, so I think it is a good idea to get back. Is there an increased risk? I wouldn't be surprised that people who have had COVID before who get vaccinated notice that they have more side effects. I'm talking about those side effects that we talk about, like the real side effects of like a sore arm, feeling kind of crappy the next day. In fact, I have a theory that people who end up getting COVID, this breakthrough cases after getting, you know, a full dose of Moderna, full dose... They're feeling the effects of their immune system fighting the virus. It's like they got a third dose because now they're getting infected with the virus, which is acting like a third Moderna or a third, you know, Pfizer or a second J and J. And just like you got your second shot and you got some side effects, you're getting some side effects from the virus. It's really just their immune system fighting it. So I think those are some of the symptoms. 
But yeah, I think you have much broader protection. The best protection is probably having natural infection and then getting fully vaccinated. Those people are like belts and suspenders. Wearing a mask, of course. Always. Right, because even though, um, you know, uh, we, we, you guys just talked about um, you You as a person may not get sick. We still, as healthcare providers, um, even if somebody does get infected um, who has been vaccinated, we'll need to be wearing our masks to protect our patients. So going back to um, that um, whole conversation about we're not only are we vaccinating to protect our patients, but we're also wearing our masks um, to protect our patients and ourselves. I just had to throw that in. Yeah, no, and there's a question that I was typing an answer to because it, but that's right. This is why masking is so important right now. We haven't really talked about masking and that's because we're all healthcare workers and we're going to wear a mask, but now more than ever, that's why we have to mask it because of the Delta variant, because as somebody said, well, wait a second, you're telling me now, even if I'm vaccinated, I could get this virus in my upper airway and shed it and spread it to other people. Yes. That is why all of a sudden I can't have my next door neighbors who are both vaccinated over for dinner anymore. Because even though they're both vaccinated and we're vaccinated, they could harbor the Delta variant, could give it to me and I could harbor it and give it to somebody else like someone who's not vaccinated or who can't get vaccinated. So exactly, that's right. Delta is a game changer. So it's not like the CDC went back and said, you know what, we changed our mind. It's because the variant changed. And we have to wear masks now when you're around other people, even if they're vaccinated outside your bubble for that very reason. Thank you so much for everyone's input and answers. Um, I'm sure we could go on for a lot longer, uh, but for the sake of time, we'll wrap things up here. Before we go, uh, Dr. Meltzer Brody, would you like to say any final words? Well, I just wanted to add, I've been so, um, interested to hear this conversation and I think it speaks to how important it is that we're honest with each other and that we talk and we ask these really important questions and we get factual information. Our colleagues, um, we need to care about each other and we need to care about what we think and we need to have honest conversations with factual information that's accurate and scientifically based. There's so much misinformation out there. We keep hearing that. And I've been so impressed with the questions and the answers from my colleagues. I'm so proud to have such amazingly smart and compassionate colleagues. Um, the doctors you're hearing from, they care so deeply about our patients and each other. And I would just add, please get accurate information. Please keep the questions coming. There's so much in misinformation. And the reality is, is that the vaccines are safe and have been given in so many people with doctors being the first running out the door, as Dr. Wool said, the overwhelming majority of physicians in this country have been vaccinated, um, hands down. And so many others have, if there was some big, bad, terrible thing, we would have known it by now. So thank you for the opportunity um, to talk and engage and, and please keep the, Please keep the questions coming and reach out. Thank you, Dr. Meltzer Brody. And that is all we have for tonight's Q&A session. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. If we did not get to your question, we will work to answer it in other formats. And if you have any other questions that come up, please email them to COVID-19 at unchealth.unc.edu. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope everyone has a good evening.